everyone. Good morning. Hey, welcome you to our services this morning. If you'll join us this morning and stand, and we'll start with Living Hope. Christ, my living 
it, turn around, say hello to your neighbor, wave at someone, give somebody a high five, tell them glad to see you. Good, good, good. Good morning there again, bro. <laughs> you can come back together and you just have a seat if you like. song this morning will be at the cross. If you didn't have a chance to pick up your communion cup out in the hallway as you're coming in, you can do that as we're singing this morning. And then Steve will have a meditation.
Day was Friday. Turning 39 is getting harder every year. <laughs> I had so many friends and family wish me a happy birthday, and, and it really felt good. I mean, you know that many people care about you. It's humbling. It was real nice. But you, but if you ever had someone close to you betray your trust? When you thought that person was the last thing that they would ever do. And when it happened, it was shocking. You couldn't believe it, that it actually would happen. As far as from the thing that you think that person was capable of doing. I think about Jesus and all the time he spent with his apostles. They witnessed miracles, changing water into wine, raising ladders from the dead, walking on water. Healing a man that was blind from birth. Feeling a man that couldn't walk. Feeding 5,000 people with a few pieces of bread and some fish. And many more. But as soon as things got tough, they denied him, they betrayed him, and silently watched his brutal crucifixion. Jesus came down in human form, so he had feelings just like we did. And it, it, it's a... When you love someone and you feel that someone loves you, it, that feeling is deeper inside. And he loved every one of his apostles. He told them many times. And they told him the same. So the sadness and sorrow Jesus must have felt for the betrayal by the very ones that professed to love him. The 
you and I, sooner than you think, may have to make a decision to acknowledge or deny Jesus before man. What decision will we make? Jesus tells us if we deny him before man, he will deny us before the Father. We take communion to remember what Jesus done for us on the cross and for profess to man he is our King of Kings and our Lord of Lords. You got a communion cup today? Take the top layer off. Get the bread. The bread represents the broken body of Jesus. He said, break this bread. You eat it. Remember me and what I've done for you on the cross. We died for our sins. We took the beating. Even when we betrayed him, he didn't betray us. He was there. He died willingly for our sins. Now take the cup. Drink from the cup, which represents the shed blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. He washes our sins clean. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your precious Son, Jesus, to earth to love us so much that he would die so that we may live, never betraying us, loving us despite of our sinful ways. May God always, may we always acknowledge God, our Lord and Savior, forever and ever. Amen.
Jesus is coming back. Amen. Amen. Those in uh, K through fifth grade can be dismissed back to binge. Thank our drama team for getting us started on this new series today. You know, hope is uh, in short supply today. If we think about our world, uh, we don't have to look around to know that. But the findings of a, a study that was done back in December uh, by Penn State, it was called the Mood of the Nation poll. They did that and they conducted it uh, to find out basically how folks were feeling about the country well, here were the results. 84% of Americans said they're extremely worried uh, or very worried about our country. 42% of Americans describe themselves extremely or very hopeful about the country. One quarter of the country reported that nothing uh, would make them hopeful, whereas just 2% said that nothing would make them worried. So we begin a study of 1 Peter uh, for the next five weeks, and the Apostle Peter opens up his letter uh, telling us about the ultimate hope in life. Look what he says. Verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to God's elect strangers in the world, scattered, he says, throughout Pontus and Galatia and Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia. He describes the people of God as people that are strangers in the world. This world is not our home. Amen? And that's what he said to them. This is they're temporary residents here. They were foreigners in this world, citizens of another kingdom. And he says, you shouldn't put your roots down too deep in this world. He also describes them as scattered. Persecution had broken out against the church and Christians were being harassed and arrested and tortured and sometimes beheaded and burned at the stake. And so many had fled Jerusalem and went to all other places in the world. Now they could have easily become very discouraged because Following Christ did not exempt them from problems. In fact, it compounded them, didn't it? Because they were Christians. Their lives were unstable. Their futures were very uncertain. So Peter writes this book to remind them that their ultimate hope is what it would be so they would not lose heart. So as we look at this, I think it's so important for us today because many of us have the battle of discouragement, don't we? Uh, we look at things that we struggle with, whether it's physical problems that many of us face every day. Some have family conflicts that really feel hopeless. Others, uh, financial stress, worry how you ever dig yourself out of the, the bind you've got yourself into. And some are discouraged because you've lost loved ones and your grief just overwhelms us or overwhelms you. And most of us uh, deal with the pressure of inflation and worrying about the, the future of our country. And what's going to go on? And just like you, I, I battle discouragement. I'm no different. Um, I know I shouldn't because God's been good to, to me and Nadine. Uh, so very good. But I get discouraged about the, the moral slide in our country. And about people that have backslidden from Christ. And uh, they fall prey to Satan's temptations all the time. I get discouraged about myself because like Paul said, the good I want to do, I don't always do. And the evil that I shouldn't do... I sometimes do. So I think we all need a study of 1 Peter and this letter of, of hope that is written to God's people that were living in times of despair and difficulty, just like the days that we're living in today. So the next few weeks, we're going to go verse by verse, and uh, we'll look at chapter 1 today, and the title of the message today, uh, live, live in Hope. And uh, we've had some songs about that and skit about that as well. You know, it's been said that people can live a month without food, you can live about five days without water. Uh, you can maybe live five minutes without air, but you can't live one second without hope. That's the old saying. And Peter writes to us about something that will give us daily hope. And that hope is in Christ. Let's look at five reasons today that we're going to live in hope in this spiritually indifferent and difficult world. Number one is we're picked by God. 
We're God's people. We're part of a victorious kingdom. Look what he says there in verse 2. You who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling by His blood, grace and peace be yours in abundance. Two words that we're going to look at here in this that provide continual hope for us as Christians. The first one is chosen. He says you're chosen according to God's foreknowledge. Now, you might remember some of you as a child how, how it made you feel to be chosen for a ball team. I don't know if you ever remember they'd split you up on two sides and, or then they'd start picking uh, you know, and make two sides, two teams. It always felt good to be, it boosted your esteem. And well, He says you've been chosen, we've been chosen by the creator of the universe to be part of this kingdom. That should make us feel really good. The term chosen suggests that God chooses some to be saved. But it does not say that God chosen some to be saved and some to be lost. That's not what this doctrine means. To be chosen means to be given the opportunity to identify with God's kingdom. Kind of reminds you maybe of the NFL draft. You know, a football player can accept or reject the offer to play for a team when they're, they're chosen, if you will. He said, you've been chosen according to what? The foreknowledge of God. To hear, to have an opportunity to respond to the gospel. You still have the option to accept or reject. You see, there's a difference between foreknowledge and predestination. Predestination means that you, you've caused something to happen. This person is going to heaven. This person is going to go to hell. That's, that's what some say predestination is all about. But foreknowledge is different. It's, it's something we, it's really hard for us to understand, but at the same time, you know, we, we get a glimpse of it. It means you've been, you know ahead of time that what, something's going to happen, what's going to transpire, but this superior wisdom that God has. Now, we don't know exactly what that means, but I think we can become so familiar with people that we have kind of a foreknowledge of what they're going to do and what they're not going to do to some extent. Like, for example, if I came home with flowers, Nadine would faint. <laughs> Not really, but almost, you know, because I, don't, I just don't do that, you know. Some say, what do you do, get them off the graveyard or something, you know? Um, the, the difference is that sometimes we're wrong about that, you know. We're wrong about people. We think, wow, that, that just blew me away. I didn't know they'd do something like that, you know. But God is never wrong. He knows ahead of time what we're going to do and how we're going to respond. He's so familiar with that. He can see in advance what we're going to do. Not that he makes us do it. But he knows it ahead of time. Look at Romans 8, 29. For those God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. He could see in advance how we're going to respond. And once you became a Christian, he kind of predestined circumstances that will assure that you become more and more like Christ. That he knows that's going to happen. And he chose you. Isn't that an awesome thing? No human being can fully, I think, understand that foreknowledge the way we should. But it's assuring to me. It should be assuring to you. That God chose you. That he gave you the chance to be part of his kingdom. And that's what you are if you're a Christian today. The second work is, he says, we're sanctified. The second word here. We're sanctified by the Holy Spirit to walk in obedience. Sanctified means what? Set apart. He set apart us for a task to be done. Certain utensils in the temple were used for uh, sanctified, for a holy use. The gold dishes were sanctified to present offerings to God. That's where they would, they'd understand that word, maybe much better than we do. And understand the Bible teaches us here that we're sanctified for a holy purpose. At the same time, we're saved. That sanctification is not a, a second work of grace that we're in. We're, as mature Christians, we never sin again, which some people teach. This happens at the same time. He says you're sprinkled by his blood. So it simply means that God has a specific plan for you, for me, for our lives. No matter how insignificant or mundane maybe our life appears, you're thinking, he's got a plan for me. Yes, he does. God's got a plan of how to use you in his kingdom. Now, we may not understand that completely until we get into eternity. And we know, we see what that is. But we can be confident right now that he is working in you and through you to advance his kingdom. Now, this should give us hope that we're promised that the end of his kingdom is going to be victorious. We know that's going to happen now. And even though like now, it may not appear that way. But remember, look back at the Israelites. And it seemed hopeless as they're trapped against the, the, the sea there, the Red Sea. And who's behind them chasing them? 
The Egyptian army is behind them. And that night, the God caused a fierce wind to part the Red Sea. And the next day, what did they do? They went through the sea. They parted through the sea. A miracle took place. Now, once on the opposite shore, you know, God's people celebrated. Of course, the water fell in and drowned the Egyptian army. The story that is there. And they could have peace. Now, we think about that event. God could have parted the Red Sea in advance. A whole week ahead of time. So when they got to the Red Sea, they would have never stopped. They could have kept right on going. But he didn't do it till right there at the last minute. I wonder why. Maybe to teach some trust for them, to trust in God, to give him the glory for what he was going to do. The Bible says in the last days that the kingdom of God will appear overwhelmed by the world. Look at 2 Timothy 3, 13. While evildoers, imposters will go from... Bad to worse, he says, deceiving, being deceived. In the last minute, the Lord Jesus will return in power and triumph. As you saw in that, that skit, Jesus is coming again. And he will put all enemies at his feet, is what the Bible says. No matter how devious evil may seem, no matter how inept the church may be at times, in the end, God will get the glory and he will get the victory. We know that to be true. The Bible says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. That gives our life hope, doesn't it? It gives our life meaning to know where we're headed. We, we, we can't just say, well, whatever. Whatever happens. Every day of life matters. Obedience matters to God. And this world is moving in dramatic form to an occasion where Jesus Christ is going to come again. And he's going to, to call things to a quit here. And he's going to emerge as King of Kings and, and Lord of Lords. And those who belong to him, you and I, then we can revel in the, the day that that's going to happen. Now, it may not seem like that now. You know, I, I heard a story told about how Harvard, uh, when they get killed in football, um, opposing fans start gloating. And the Harvard stu student body, they developed a kind of retaliatory cheer um, that kind of keeps things in perspective. So when the opposing fan, uh, they start, you know, cheering about the, a touchdown they made, the Harvard students, they start this chant. And it goes like this. It says, that's all right, that's okay, you're going to work for us someday. <laughs> Which is pretty cool, you know. That's okay, that's all right, you're going to work for us someday. We can say, that's okay, every knee is going to bow, you know. When we're tempted to be discouraged, we know Jesus Christ is coming again. We have the victory, even though it might seem like the devil is having a heyday right now. Christ is going to reign. And because of His grace on us, it should give us peace. We should have hope in abundance because of that. We're chosen to be part of God's kingdom. We're sanctified to, to have this part in ministry that we take part in, whether that's telling somebody about Christ or doing something at church or whatever it is that God's gifted you in. Second thing is, we're provided new birth and a new inheritance. We've been born again, and we've been guaranteed eternal life. Look at verses 3 and 4. Praise be to the God, the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, into an inheritance that can never perish, never spoil our faith, kept in heaven for you. This reminds me of another scripture, what Jesus said to Nicodemus. He said, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is, what? Born again. How can a man be born when he's old, Nicodemus asked. Surely he can't enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born again. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh. Spirit gives birth to spirit. When we're born in this world, we inherit uh, the sin nature of Adam. Not necessarily the sin. We're not born that way, but we have that nature that's there that, that pulls at us. And just as sure as, as we choose, we're going to choose to sin, we're going to choose to sin just as sure as a, a baby is going to cry. Because flesh gives birth to flesh, he says. It brings flesh. We then, by sin, are, are separated from God. And unless we're born again by the Spirit of God... He says, we don't have a hope of heaven. You know, we hear people talk about, well, we're born-again Christians. That's really a, a redundant phrase, if you think about it. All Christians have been born again. Uh, if you're not born again, 
you're not really a Christian, right? Uh, we think about it. And an all-important question is, is how and when we're born again. 1 Peter 1.23 says, For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring Word of God. The first step is to hear the Word of God, to accept that it is true, that the testimony about Christ is truthful. Then you respond in obedience. You choose to repent of your sin. You choose to confess Jesus as Lord. You choose to be baptized into Him. You know, when the seed of the husband is planted into the womb of the wife, the miracle of life begins. Nine months later, the mother's water bursts, and a new baby is born into the world. When the seed of the Word of God is received into our soul, the miracle of new spiritual life begins. You walk away hearing the Word of God. You know something unusual is taking place within you. As the Word of God develops, one day you say, I'm now ready to respond. And you burst forth, if you will, from the baptistry and a new body in Christ, a new babe in Christ. Look what Titus, how he puts it. In Titus 3, 5 through 7, Paul says this to Titus. He says, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth, the renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously when Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. That's why Dr. Buford Bryant used to say this. He said, the baptistry is a tomb and a womb. It's a tomb we die to self, but it's a womb in which we're born again into the kingdom of God. The Bible says if anyone's in Christ, he is a, what? A new creation. We're new creation. He said, the old is gone. The new has come. Now, once you've been born again, you've got a, a living hope that, that endures for all time. All other hopes are dying hopes. But when we become a Christian, that is a hope in Jesus Christ, the person of Christ who defeated death. We find it says in great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead into an inheritance that can never perish, never spoil, never fade, and is kept in heaven. Think about that. Our hope in heaven won't perish. means it's, it's untouched by death. It also won't spoil. It's uncontaminated by sin. It won't fade. It means it's not affected by time. It endures the... The, the business world, the ups and downs of the stock market and food shortages and inept politicians and rebellious children and aging bodies and uh, eroding values, it endures it all. We can have a hope that will never perish, never spoil, never fade, and it's kept where? In heaven for us. That's what the Bible says. Kept. I like that word. It's reserved. Any of you ever called in advance to make a hotel reservation? Maybe on a trip. You do that so that you make sure that you're going to have a room, a place to stay. And, uh, you know, you may get to, into the town where you've called ahead 300 miles ahead of time. And it may have no vacancy at all the hotels you come in there. But are you worried? Nope, you've made the phone call. And you know whether you show up at 4 o'clock in the afternoon or 12 o'clock at night, they're supposed to have a room for you. And that assurance makes your trip enjoyable. You don't have to worry. You've got a peace of mind. You're relaxed about it. Jesus said to us, don't let your hearts be troubled. I'm going to do what? I'm going to prepare a place for you. Do you believe that today? That's right. And because he's done that, we don't have to worry. Your room in heaven is paid in advance by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? It's paid for already. So whether you check in at age 6 or 106, you know, it's kept in heaven for you. The room is there. So that living hope gives us something, gives us confidence as we move on in life, that life that seems to be falling apart many times, we know we've got reservations. Third thing is we're protected by God's power. Let's look at next verse, verse 5. We're protected by God and we're exempt uh, from unnecessary pain. He says, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, what does it mean we're shielded by God's power? 
any of you who ever rode a motorcycle will know that a windshield comes in pretty handy because you don't get bugs in your teeth. It, it stops those uh, from happening. Now, obviously, that's a shield in a way, and God shields you um, from things. And does he shield us from all suffering? No. But he does shield us from front-on collisions, if you will, head-on attacks from Satan that would destroy us or would cause us to be incapable of fulfilling God's will. Satan said to God, you know, it's, it's no wonder that Job is such a good person. And we find in Job 1.10, you, you put a hedge around him. You put a hedge around his household, around everything he's got. Now, if he lost his protection, I'm paraphrasing this part, well, then he's going to curse you. You know, you just take the hedge down. At that point, God kind of lowered the gate. He lowered the hedge of protection so that Job's faith could be tested and proved genuine. But when God lowered that hedge of protection, there were still limitations to what Satan could do. He could attack his belongings, but not his body at first. Then later, he could afflict his body, but he couldn't take his life. Job was still partially shielded, protected by God. God allowed a certain amount of suffering, and that would prove necessary, and it would prove beneficial to Job. I think we're often shielded by God's power, and we don't know it. We just don't recognize it. I look at Matthew 18.10. It reminds me, See that you do not look out, down on one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. God sees every believer at every moment. He knows what's going on. And He knows when each one of us might need the intervention of an angel in our life. Or His protection there is there. And because they continually see the face of God, the angels are at His disposal to help any one of us at any time. We're protected by ministering angels of God. And also, the flip side is something we don't think about is... We also have a chance to minister to angels at times. Yeah, I know this is another angel study, but I just thought I'd throw this in here. Look at Hebrews 13 too. Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. For some of you have done this, you've entertained what? Angels without realizing. Angels unaware. Like the song Alabama, Angels Among Us. I love that song. This passage makes a direct <coughs> reference to Genesis 18 and 19 because Abraham and Lot they, were showed, they showed hospitality to these visitors that came to their house. Now, who were these visitors? Angels, that's right. Messengers of God. I don't wonder how many times, back to the idea of angels protect. I wonder how many times God has placed a hedge of protection around you and me, and we just didn't see it. We didn't know about it. I know of some times in my life that if it were not for His protection, I know I'd be dead. I know it would be. Um... Maybe he shields us from stupid mistakes you've made. Any of you made stupid mistakes? How many of you wonder how you got out of your teenage years? <laughs> Some of you are thinking, yeah, if you only knew what happened here and there. You know, Satan's goal is to, to kill and to steal and to destroy. That's what he wants to do. And I'm, I'm convinced that his attacks amongst us will be more vicious if he didn't restrain you. A crippling virus is about to attack your young child and an angel wards that off. A mugger singles you out in the parking lot and for some reason he hears a siren or someone else distracts him and you get away. A drunk driver is headed right for you, a head-on collision, but he runs out of gas or he swerves off the road into the ditch. Or some of you, you, you look back and you think, this happened to me and I can't explain how it happened or why, but I know that if I were down the road a little bit further, I would have been in an accident. Maybe we've been shielded so many times that we just forget. And I think if we understood how much God shielded us and protected us, instead of complaining to God about all the things and all the bad things we're going through, I think we'd go to our knees in gratitude and expression to thank Him for how many times He saved us, how many times He's looked after us. All evil is subject to God. And even evil cannot touch God's children Unless God allows it. So that should give us hope in the face of knowing that we're shielded by God's power from unnecessary pain. But that leads us to the next thing that we need to make sure to get our theology straight. Because if we stop there, that would not be enough. We're proved genuine by suffering. So let's look at this. Because we, have, we find meaning in suffering. And we need to be thankful 
um, that it's only temporary. Look at what he says in verse 6 and 7. In this you rejoice greatly, or you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief of all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine. And they result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Bless you. To be shielded by God's power does not mean that we're exempt from pain. God does allow uh, suffering with a purpose. We look back at Job. His suffering proved that he was genuine. And, and, and think about in our world, how many of us have looked back to Job? You know, I know I have. And he's been an inspiration. Paul's thorn in the flesh, you know, was allowed to keep him from being conceited. I think about Joseph. He probably didn't understand the pit and the prison. But later on he did. Look what he told his brothers. As for you, you meant this for evil against me, but God meant it for what? For good. In order to bring about this present result to keep my people alive, he was in control of the grain, and he was able to dispense and keep so many people from starving because he'd been sold into slavery, because he was put in charge there in Egypt. God allows pain that he deems necessary to strengthen us, to comfort us, to force us to rely on Him. Maybe to appreciate the suffering of Jesus Christ. To get our focus off of this world at times. Now, no, none of us would volunteer and say, Hey, Lord, I hear I am. I want to suffer some. You know, none of us would do that. Suffering serves for positive purposes. Now, I think we can find hope because He says this suffering is meaningful and it's temporary. He says, Now for a little while you may have to suffer grief. In all kinds of trials. We can put up with a lot of things if it's purposeful and it's passing. It's kind of like a mother that goes into labor with a child. Um, that's a hard thing. Difficult thing. I've not had to go through that. But mo you mothers that have, you know at the end result is going to be a baby that you, you can glory in so that you think it's okay. Perhaps you're hurting a lot right now. God knows about that. Maybe you're getting discouraged. Um, you can't even imagine what it'd be to, to be happy again. I tell you, don't lose heart. Don't quit. That's God's message to you from Peter. Continue to put your hope and your trust in the Lord God Almighty. That's what he says to do. He will see you through. He promises us our light and momentary troubles, he says, are achieving for us eternal glory that far outweighs them all. That's what he says there in 2 Corinthians 4, 17. So this pain that we're going through, God can use this temporary pain to deepen us, to make us stronger and connected with Him. Many of you have gone through hardships and vows in your life. You can testify to that. Peter compared it to gold that was heated. And when gold is heated, all the impurities come out. It's a purifying fire, hot, and it's painful. But in the end, it results in something that's more valuable. Something that's more virtuous. I think about how a nurse relates a story about an experience she had in training. She was working in a burn unit of a children's hospital. And she was to take a scrub brush over a badly burned arms of an 18-month-old child who was screaming in pain. Now, it was not a soft sponge. I wish to say it was. But it was more like a Brillo pad. And she was to scrape off all the dead cells in that child's skin. So it would begin to heal properly. She thought, I just can't do it. I can't hurt this child like this. So the doctor took her aside and showed her a picture of another burn victim where the healed skin was so scarred and so stiff that it shriveled up and the arm actually had no movement in it whatsoever. And she learned from that that if, if she didn't scrub that burn, that it was going to be a crippled arm is what was going to happen. So she had to do it so that the child would have unrestricted movement, and so the child later on would be joyful that that scrubbing took place. So she went on to scrub the child who was screaming. He did not understand until years later he would what that nurse had done for him. The great physician sometimes allows us to experience excruciating pain. But it's necessary for our health and for our growth in Him. Do we like it? No. And it's difficult. 
And I feel for some of you that are going through it uh, right now, having that pain. Let's look at the next few verses. He says, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold that perishes, even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine, may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. And then look what he says. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him. And you're filled with inexpressible and glorious joy for you're receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of our souls. Warren Wordsby used to put it like this. He says, when you're in the furnace, God keeps his hand on the thermostat and his eye on the clock. And I like that. God's still in control. Lastly, we're privileged recipients of God's plan. We have knowledge of the gospel and we understand God's overall plan. Look at verse 10 and 11 and 12. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that has come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and the circumstance to which the, the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. He says the Old Testament prophets here that predicted the coming of the Messiah, they didn't completely understand it. They, they didn't know. They, he, they wrote symbolic language of the coming of the Messiah. The Messiah like he's led like a sheep to the slaughter and his body would, would be abandoned to the grave and they didn't fully understand, he says, what they're saying. Look at verse 12. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of the things that had not now been told you by those who preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels, he says, long to look into these things. You see, even the angels didn't fully comprehend and understand God's plan until it unfolded. When the, when the angel Gabriel came to Mary and told her that she was going to give birth to a son, I, believe, I don't believe Abel, Gabriel fully understood that, that Jesus was going to be someone that was going to die. For the sins of all mankind. The angels of, of heaven. I, I, and think about them. And, and their understanding of the gospel. The gospel is called a mystery. A sacred secret. That would not be revealed until it was completed. Could, so can you imagine when Jesus was being brutalized by the, by the Romans on the cross. Can you see 10,000 angels with swords drawn. Ready to come down. And God stopping them said no, no, no. That's part of the plan. Paul said... Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given to me so that I can fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. Now, I think if, if the angels of heaven didn't fully understand it and was completed, neither did the fallen angel who is Satan. I don't think he knew it as well. I think when he saw Jesus dying on that cross, he thought he won a victory. He thought he had won. It wasn't until Jesus rose from the dead that he fully understood that he had been defeated, that he was going down. Look at Revelation 12, 12. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. So what was hidden from the prophets, what was hidden from the angels and from Satan himself, he says, is now revealed to who? To us we understand that Jesus Christ was pierced for our transgressions that he was crushed for our iniquities that the punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed we get that we understand that Jesus suffering was for his glory that the cross was his finest hour if you will it provides us with the forgiveness of sins it provides us with the hope of eternal life and we are blessed beyond measure to live on this side of the cross and to know and to have heard the life-giving, the hope-filled message of Jesus Christ. Aren't you thankful? You need to be. We live in hope because of Jesus Christ. Now, as the, the band comes and we sing our, our last song, I don't want you to miss this because here's the point. If at that moment that appeared to be the worst moment of all for Jesus Christ was his finest hour, then 
Shouldn't, our fo shouldn't the followers of Christ, you and me, retain hope in Jesus Christ because we know that our suffering is going to lead to what? Our finest hour. To heaven itself. Look at Romans 8, 28. We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him who have been called according to His purpose. Chuck Colson wrote in his book, Born Again, that it was prison that humbled him, that brought him to the Lord. For many of you, maybe you can point to some time in your life that was a hardship that brought you to God. And you know that it's because of that today that you are a Christian. Today, maybe some of you have come and you're wondering about the hardships that you're going through. and You're having a hard time finding hope in, in a world that seems to be hopeless. Well, I'm going to tell you, if your hope is in your business, if your hope is in your health, if your hope is in your family, if your hope is in this world, then truly you're going to be hopeless. But we find our hope where? In Jesus Christ. And the one who lives again through the one who paid the price for you and me so that we could have salvation, so that we could have the hope of eternal life today. So today, you've got the privilege uh, to hear the Word of God. Many people in the world have not had that privilege. You've been blessed to be sanctified, to, to be used by God in, in a way that many can't do that. But you've been blessed to be able to. You today have have heard about the hope of Jesus Christ. You've been the place in, in the freedom of the country to hear that message. So today, if, if some of you are, are, are scraping and, and looking for hope in this world, I tell you, turn your eyes away from that. Put your hope in Christ. Maybe some of you need to do that for the very first time today. Some of you need to say, I've heard the message. That message maybe has been burning in my heart. I know I need to confess Him as Lord. I need to repent. I need to be baptized. I need to step forward. And Jesus has He's invited me. He's there with His arms open wide. And it's up to me to accept. It's up to me to accept the offer that has been given. He's calling you today. I may be standing up front, but just as His representative, He's the one here. One, the one that's here with His arms open wide, saying, "Come to me." Won't you come today? As we sing in Christ alone. Let's stand together and sing.
Sunday school is right after this in about 25 minutes. We have class in here, classes across the street for our young people as well. So I hope you'll hang around for Sunday school. We also have a mother-daughter banquet coming up this coming weekend. So we need sign-ups by, I think it's Wednesday is our sign-up uh, deadline date. And that's so we'll know the number to give uh, Captain Bob's for our caterer for, for that. So that's our mother-daughter banquet coming up. Any other announcements before I close? Okay, let's pray together. Dear God, thank you so much for your blessings. Thank you so much for loving us, the love that's unfathomable. We thank you, Lord, for blessing us to be able to be here today. We thank you, Lord, for the hope that we have through Jesus Christ. In a world that may be falling apart around us, we have hope. And let us express that to the people around us. May they see Christ in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.